Okay, so uh, hi, uh, good afternoon or evening, everyone. So I'm very happy to be here today for this uh, last talk uh, of the day. And just before I start, I would like to just thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work that I've done on the um, spin orbit coupling, interaction, and the ZPR. Oh. Okay, so uh, the origin of the work I will be discussing today is uh, this uh, work, which is a reference here, in which uh, we did investigate the consequences of non-adiabatic effects on the zero-point renormalization of the band gap uh, for semiconductors. So in this work, um, uh, we did demonstrate that the long-range Frehlich interaction completely dominates the ZPR for polar materials, and also showed that uh, including these effects in the calculation is indeed essential to obtain agreement with experimental data. Yet, uh, for consistency at the time, spin orbit interaction was neglected throughout this, this work, even for the heaviest materials in the set. So uh, the question I will address today is uh, how will spin orbit coupling and, um, will affect both the first principle ZPR and the Frölich interaction? So um, just before going on, let's first recall how does a spin orbit coupling affect the electronic structure at the DFT level? So in this talk, I will focus on zinc blend materials. So here, as an example, you have the band structure of kenium telluride. So without spin orbit coupling, those are the dashed blue lines. The, um, it's well known that the valence band extrema is strictly degenerate. And when we add spin orbit coupling, those are solid red lines. This degeneracy is lifted such that the extrema is now the fourfold heavy hole and light hole bands. And we have the two split off bands that have been pushed further down in energy. But apart from this, we can also observe two different effects. First, there's the sort of global lowering of the electronic energies uh, in the, the occupied bands throughout the blue wind zone. And second, uh, the band curvature, hence the effective masses, are modified um, close to the band extrema. So I won't go into detail about the methodology since it's been discussed uh, already in the previous talk. So um, what we we, uh, we did work with was the allen heine kaldana formalism uh, with DFT plus DFPT computational framework. And all the post-processing was done with the electron phonon coupling Python module by Gabriel Antonius. So within this framework, uh, no, RZPR is given by the real part of the electron phonon self-energy which is itself the sum of these fan and the bywaller contribution. And now if we quickly take a look at uh, the actual explicit expression for the fans of energy that I'm showing here uh, in the light of what we just discussed, well, we can think that even if in principle, um, all the physical quantities which enter this expression will naturally be affected by including spin orbit interaction, um, we can still reasonably think that uh, the leading effect on the ZPR might come from the change in these uh, electronic energies in the denominators. OK, so let me now bring back uh, the figure I flashed on the first slide, uh, which is telling us how does our computed ZP, uh, band cap ZPR compares to available experimental data. So basically, uh, the goal here is to have all the data points lie in inside this shaded gray area that you see. So in blue are our previous results without spin orbit coupling. And now if we compute uh, the band gap renormalization with spin orbit coupling, we get these uh, red triangles. And well, we can see that the method retains pretty good pre predictive capabilities, even though the, for the heaviest materials in the set, uh, they tend to move towards the lower bound. But the most noticeable thing here is that, well, what we could have thought before was an apparent strong overestimation of the ZPR for kenium telluride. In fact, it can be very simply and naturally explained by the lack of a spin orbit interaction in the original set. Okay. So let's now take a look at uh, the different first principle results in a little more detail. And note that for the remaining of this talk, I will only address the valence band renormalization. So what I'm showing you here is the ratio of the ZPR with to, um, to without spin orbit coupling with or ZPR reduction ratio uh, with respect to the split off energy, which is a direct indicator of the spin orbit coupling strength. So for all the materials I'm showing here, the valence band extrema is made from P states of either the four, uh, five or six atom. 
And what I want you to get from this figure is that, well, just as we could have expected, the stronger the spin orbit coupling, the larger the reduction of the CPR as we go, for example, from sulfides to selenides to tellurides. But what will actually give us more insight about uh, what is really happening here is to look at different regimes in terms of the norm of the phonon wave vector. So what you see here are histograms of, uh, whoops, of uh, contribution to the ZPR for uh, different two point norms. And those bottom panels here show, um, just show the distribution of the Brillouin zone weight. So the shaded histograms are without spin orbit coupling in solid colors or with spin orbit coupling. So let's take a look at the key elements of these plots. Uh, first, we can see that for both these materials, the strongest and uh, the greatest part of ZPR comes from a very small portion of. Uh, of the Brillouin zone at small q. Uh, and this is um, the, uh, pr um, the signature of the um, predominance of the Frelich interaction. Second, if we compare the solid and shaded histograms, well, we can see first that a spin orbit interaction has barely any effect on cadmium sulfide, except at very, very small q, while for, for cadmium telluride, um, uh, the reduction of the CPR originates from the whole Prilouin zone. So both from the small Q regime where it can be linked to the change of the effective mass and from the large Q regime where uh, we can explain it from this global reduction of the electronic energies. We can even further refine this analysis and now do a mode decomposition of the CPR. If we look now at uh, cadmium telluride on the right. So what this decomposition is telling us is that uh, First, in the small Q regime, the reduction of the ZPR is entirely dominated by the yellow mode that's shown in red, thus confirming the Fröhlich picture, while in the large Q regime, it originates almost equally from all the different modes. And this is a feature that we absolutely do not see um, in cadmium sulfide. So these observations will prove important to understand um, our later uh, the results from the generalized Fröhlich model that I will show a little bit later. Okay. So now I will completely switch gears and start discussing the Frölich model. So um, the basic points were addressed a little, uh, a little before by in the Guillaume talk. So this model was developed in the 1950s and uh, since it became a real cornerstone um, of all modern polaron studies. And very quickly, what it um, in its original formulation, it describes as one single electron in um, ideal bands, so isotropic, non-degenerate, and um, perfectly parabolic, which interacts with um, macroscopic polarization that's generated by one long wavelength uh, LO phonon. So in this picture, uh, the Frölich expression for the ZPR is um, parameterized by this uh, parameter, only one parameter, which is alpha. So you have the definition here. And as you can see, it depends only on a uh, very simple physical quantity. So it's actually quite an elegant for us. So, um, and uh, while this model gives us a very intuitive picture of the physical mechanisms behind electron phonon interaction, it still lacks applicability to real materials as it does not allow for degeneracies, anisotropy, or uh, multiple element modes. So what we're going to do now in order to is to lift some, uh, these limitations and construct a generalized Frölich model starting from the full first principles expression for the fan self energy that's shown here on top. So we start by neglecting the contribution of all bands, except those that are degenerate to the band extrema that's being corrected. And uh, then the um, matrix element will describe dielectric interaction with LO phonon in the small Q limit. Then following the original Frölich model, we take the uh, continuum limit and extend the Brillouin zone boundaries to infinity. And finally, we suppose we that we have a flat phonon dispersion as well as a parabolic electron band that could be described by an effective mass. And then going to compute the radial integral in this last expression. And then we're left with this final uh, formula for the generalized Frölich CPR. So from here, I will focus only on the Zangblend structure, which is only one isotropic LO mode. I will also suppose that this phonon frequency, mode polarity vector, and dielectric constant here will not be significantly um, affected when we include spin orbit interaction. 
So in this very simplified picture, uh, the Fröhlich ZPR is then proportional to the average on the degenerate bands of this angular averaged square root effective mass. And from this, we can then obtain a very simple uh, formula to estimate the reduction of the ZPR uh, by spin orbit coupling in the Fröhlich picture. And what this expression is telling us is that it's going to be a combined effect of uh, both the change in the effective masses themselves and the loss of degeneracy through these uh, one half and one third factors. Okay. So we just saw that the key ingredient uh, we need for the model is an angular average effective mass. Now, in the current uh, Abinet implementation, if I want to get the effective mass tensor from the FPT with spin orbit coupling, uh, it can only be computed with PAW. While on the other hand, if I want to compute the chon phonon interaction with spin orbit coupling, it is restricted to non conserving total potential. Hence, uh, what are we going to do to get some consistent way of computing both approaches? So, as a first step, what we decided to do is to work with the Luttinger Cohn Hamiltonian. So basically what we're doing is first we start by computing those uh, Luttinger parameters, A, B, and C, and this can be done using Abinit. Um, so the parameters are printed out when we do a Fröhlich model calculation without spin orbit coupling for uh, a band extrema that is strictly degenerate. So they're going to be um, in the uh, dot out file. And then we can use these three parameters and the split of energy that we can get from a static band structure as input for the six band losing jerkle model with spin orbit coupling. And from this model, we can then solve and get the dispersion for the uh, heavy hole and light hole bands. And then uh, we use finite differences to get all the effective masses that are required to do the angular integral. Okay. Let's now take a look at how do the model results relate to the first principle ones. So this figure is exactly the same as I've shown you before, CPR reduction ratio with respect to split of energy. And the blue uh, circles are the first principle results I've shown earlier. So if we first focus only on the, on the generalized Fröhlich model results, which are the red triangles, well, First, we see that the qualitative trend in, is correct, namely the ratio decreases with stronger spin orbit coupling. But from a quantitative point of view, however, uh, it is clear that the model underestimates the reduction uh, for heavy material and overestimates it when spin orbit coupling is weak. So in order to uh, interpret this behavior, what I'm going to do is add to the plot those yellow squares, which correspond to the ZPR reduction ratio for the yellow mode only from the first principle calculation. And uh, I'm doing so since by construction, uh, the Fröhlich model describes only LO modes. So what do we get? Uh, at large split of energy, we find that uh, the uh, generalized Fröhlich model and LO modes agree actually quite well. And in fact, the LO modes themselves cannot fully account for the effect of the spin orbit coupling on the ZPR. And if you recall the histograms I've shown earlier, well, this difference here is simply, uh, it simply comes from the contribution of the acoustic and TO modes in the large Q regime. So this means that uh, the model is predictive within uh, its different limitations. On the opposite, if we go at weak spin orbit coupling, then th these large Q effects are much, much smaller and the model clearly strongly overestimates the reduction, the, the effect of spin-off coupling, even on the yellow mode. So now uh, in order to understand why we observe such a behavior, we have to go back a few steps uh, at, the, at the radial integral, which was done uh, during the construction of the gym. So this integral assumes that um, the electronic bands can be described by an effective mass. And uh, but yeah, and what I would like you to notice on this zoom, the band structure on the right is that, well, when we have spin orbit coupling, the, that's the red line. So um, the, the um, parabolic approximation actually only holds for about 10% of the Brillouin zone for uh, the, the light hole bands and slightly more for the heavy hole. And that could actually be quite problematic since by construction, uh, the model supposes that we can use this asymptotic solution for the radial integral. So in order to uh, investigate this, what we did is to evaluate this radial integral at a finite upper bound, which corresponds to the smallest wave vector at which uh, parabolicity is lost. 
So the figure on the right compares the results for the different materials to the asymptotic solution, uh, which is shown in black. So for most materials, uh, we get about 60 to 80 percent of the asymptotic limit, which is good. Uh, we do not expect to, uh, to get the full asymptotic value since the Brillouin zone uh, is finite. But in the case of weak spin orbit coupling, uh, that is when the split of energy has the same order of magnitude as the LO frequency, what we find is that this loss of parabolicity occurs in an energy window which is smaller than the, the LO frequency, so in this hatched area of the graph here. And in fact, what's the, what this means is that um, the parabolic approximation starts to break down inside uh, the energy range, which is physically relevant to describe the Frölich interaction, and uh, hence the strong overestimation that we observe in our results. Okay, so uh, in summary, we, we have investigated the effect of spin orbit interaction on the ZPR for uh, 11 benchmarks and conductors. Um, our first principle results show that the ZPR reduction originates from the LO mold, the small Q, and from all molds, it's large Q. And uh, our generalized Frilich model with spin orbit interaction can account for the correct trend, but fails to be predictive when uh, spin orbit coupling is weak. And if I still have time, just a few words about uh, the future work that I intend to do on this project. So uh, uh, first thing I would like to do is to implement this generalized Frölich model with spin orbit coupling, but still using finite differences, but start um, getting the finite differences from the uh, full ab initio dispersion instead of using the Littinger cone model. And uh, on the other hand, uh, one thing I would really like to do is to um, isolate how the ZPR is affected um, by spin orbit interaction from the matrix elements and from the eigenvalues, like to be able to isolate the effects from both uh, quantities. And uh, with that, I will thank you for your attention and I will happily take your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Veronique, a very nice talk. Um, so uh, I don't see any questions yet. Um, uh, so maybe I'll ask a stupid one in the meantime, so people <laughs> come up with something <laughs> more clever. So you mentioned at some point that uh, uh, the, the effective mass can be calculated with Abinit only by using PAW. Uh, when you want to use spin orbit interaction. Uh -huh. If, if uh, but I mean, from the, the DFPT uh, framework that was uh, in, that's implemented, if you don't use spin orbit interaction, you can use either PAW or non conserving pseudos. But if you, um, if you want to use uh, spin orbit interaction, it's restricted to PAW for now. Wow, this is, a, this is the first time I, I hear of a property that can be calculated uh, with a code with PAW that cannot be calculated with non conserving. <laughs> 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 you can guess who implemented it. <laughs> Who's that? The, all the CE guys, they do everything in PW. Uh, I can perhaps answer, Max. That's because you, in PAW, when, you are, when we are interested in some property located only on the electron near the nucleus, mm -hmm. you only consider the on-site terms on the localized basis of the PAW approach. And okay. this is much more simple than considering the whole implementation on the plane waves. Okay, I see. But uh, the effective mass doesn't sound like a property that is uh, that depends on the. No, 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 not the effective mass, but the spin orbit correction. It's okay. an approximation. Of course, it's an approximation. Yeah. It would be better to do, but it's uh, huge work. To, okay. It's in not ways, finished. It's Introduce as for non conserving. But it's also in normal conserving, it's an approximation. Actually, it's taken from the isolated atom, the spin orbit term. So it's frozen. In PW, you have some kind of readjustment of the, the pseudo potential strength. So, so the story of spin offs in the DFPT part of Abinit is not finished. Yeah. But Mark, at the, from the practical point of view, one should add the, the, the derivative with respect to K of the spin orbit part, L dot S. Yes. Uh, you, what do you mean? You mean that we need a, the plane wave part of that? So the effective mass is with the non-conserving plus spin orbit part. Yes, of course it's better. It's a work that I have done with Jonathan Laflamme, you, if, if some remember him. And, uh, 
to include spin orbit coupling, we, he, well, uh, yes, it was much more simple to uh, attack it with PLW. Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps I have a comment because, okay, one of the last points raised by Veronique was that she would like to understand the effect of spin orbit coupling with electron phonon matrix elements. It, it, in principle, this is possible with a binit because you can disable the spin orbit part in the computation of the electron phonon matrix elements. I can. Oh, that's great. Because in fact, that, that's something that I've tried to address in a way that was not really successful for us. I was going to dive into the code to look how I can control. Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, you're telling me I can disable the, the spin orbit interaction for the matrix elements? For the non-local part. And now there's an indirect effect because obviously you have solved the DFPT problem with the spin orbit coupling. Yeah. So you, you have the, the local part of the scattering potential that obviously will uh, have seen the spin orbit mm -hmm. at the DFPT level. But when you enter the electron phonon part, if we neglect this implicit dependency, there's another explicit dependence when you compute the derivative with respect to the atom, because the spin orbit coupling is sitting on the, on the atom. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a variable that allows you to scale the strength of the spin orbit coupling interaction. And you, you even can... in non conserving, I, I know it... I looked at one variable which allowed to scale it, but it seemed, from what I understood very quickly when I looked at the documentation, it seemed to be uh, applicable for PAW. So maybe if it's available for a non conserving, I'll be very happy to use it. That, that's exa exactly the kind of button I would need. Yes, there is a trick in the case of non-conserving pseudo-potential. You, you have to use the alchemical mixing of uh, one potential with uh, another, but uh, uh, well, in order to vary the strength of the spin orbit uh, coupling. But actually, what you need to do is, uh, in principle, to go to, to, to zero. So this would simply well, make, uh, I, what we were what I was discussing with Michelle was to, to keep it close to zero, but not exactly zero to make sure that um, uh, the bands have the right character with the indices N and N prime. Okay, then, then indeed you can make an alchemical mixing of uh, uh, two cases, one with spin orbit and one without uh, spin orbit. There must be a test case for, for this. I will try to find something. Okay, that's great, thank you.